Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're tuning in. Hello, and welcome to this special event webinar symposium entitled Elevate the Role of MRI in Your RT Department with Electa and Philips Innovations. My name is Allison Stroud from Philips Healthcare, and I'm joined by my partner and colleague, Ben Perkins from Electa, who's helping to chair this webinar. Electa and Philips are on a joint mission to elevate the role of MRI in radiotherapy and provide you with a more integrated solution between planning and treatment, delivering truly personalized and precise radiotherapy. As testament to this joint mission, Electra and Philips have partnered to introduce the world's first high field MR guided LINAC, the Unity System, which both our presentations will feature today. Between the Philips MRRT simulator and the Electra Unity, we can offer our patients an end to end MR workflow, allowing them to benefit from MR's superior tissue, uh, soft tissue contrast every step of the way. Before we introduce today's speakers, please note you can type any of your questions in the boxes provided and then they will be addressed live by our speakers at the end of the session. That's right, Ben. So I'm really excited for today's program. First up today, we have two radiation oncologists, Associate Professor Pataya Donkolchai and Dr. Wiwichai Situang from the Faculty of Medicine at Siri Raj Hospital in Bangkok, Thailand. And their presentation is entitled MRI Guided Radiotherapy for Cer Cervical Cancer Patients the journey of Siri Raj Hospital experience. So I'm excited to present this group and uh, let's take a look. Hello everyone. I am Dr. Pitaya Dan Gunchai. And here is my colleague, Dr. Vivet Thai Sitiwong. Today, we will be presenting in the topic of MR guided radiotherapy for cervical cancer patients, the journey of Sirat Hospital experience. Let me introduce our hospital. Sirat is the oldest and one of the biggest hospitals in Thailand with IPD patients around uh, 2,000 and OPD patients around uh, 3 million per year. For radiation oncology division, we treat patients around uh, 3,000 patients per year. The most common cancer were breast, prostate, cervix, rectum, and lung. Here are the facility at our division. We have total two CT simulator, one MR simulator, six Linux machines, one cyber knife, one MR Linux, and also brachytherapy after loader, and IORT. Today, we will focus on the benefits of these two machines, MR simulators and MR Linux. For MR simulator, uh, this one uh, is Philip in, in, in Engineer 3 Tesla. We do MR simulation in most of uh, simulation patients around uh, 75 percent. Why do we use quite amount of numbers of MR simulations? Here is an example of cervical cancer. We do CT and MR simulation for uh, every case and at uh, three to four weeks we do MR uh, pre brachytherapy in order to see the response and uh, for selection of applicators. And we also do MR simulation at least at the at first fractions of brachytherapy. Moreover, after treatments, we sometimes 
uh, use our MR simulations as MR diagnostic MR to see the treatment response. One important point about MR simulation in the context that we have MR DNAC is that can we perform only MR simulation and calculations based on the synthetic CT in order to reduce the time for the patients and workload for the staff. Philips MR provides the software to generate synthetic CT or MR CAT in many regions of the body. The main question of using MR CAT for those calculations is whether it's able to provide the correct or similar dose compare to CT simulation or not. We are now conducting the study on this issue by comparing the contouring dose distribution targets and OAR dose between these two images. But there are some concern points, for example, calcifications, imperfect bone generations, air in the bowel, and motion artifact, which could properly affect in construction of image. Here are the preliminary results for the ratio of uh, bladder uh, and rectums between volume of synthetic CT and CT simulations is nearly one, which means the volume are almost the same. For those coverage and hot of the target, this was a very small difference. For the QA, the gamma index passed all criteria for all cases. To conclude, synthetic CT is able to provide similar volume of target and OAR contouring and also similar dose calculations and is appearing to adopt into our clinic. How about MR Linux at Sirat Hospital? We installed MR Linux around the end of 2020 and start treatment from January 2021 until September 2022. We have treated almost uh, 250 patients and almost 5,000 fractions. Most of patients uh, were prostate cancer, following lymph node metastasis, cervical cancer, rectum cancer, and pancreatic cancer. The outcome of prostate cancer was quite impressive, with biochemical control of 98% and very low toxicity for both GI and GU toxicity. For now, we are quite sure the MR Linux contribute to excellent clinical outcome and low toxicity. How about cervical cancer? From this moment, I would like to hand on the next session to Dr. Vivatai. I am Dr. Vachai, and thank you, Dr. Pitya, for presenting um, about the benefit of MR Linux and MR simulation. Um, we know from Dr. Pitya that uh, prostate cancer, um, from the perspective of MR Linux, has a very good um, clinical outcome and a very low toxicity profile. How about cervical cancer? Why MR Linux is appealing for cervical cancer? Since we know that uterus and cervix is a moving organ, its motion is affected by bladder filling and rectal filling. So it is important that we can track the tumor during the treatment. And MR Linux is able to do the motion monitoring uh, from the MRI so that we can track the tumor all the time during the treatment. Moreover, cervical cancer um, is a tumor that have a quite a very good response to uh, radiotherapy. So it can shrink very well, and we can adapt the plan to be exactly the same for tumor size for every drug treatment. However, there is still a limitation of Alinex for treating cervical cancer because the field length 
uh, of MR line height is about um, 22 centimeters, so that the maximum P2 length uh, for trading that we can draw the contour is about 20 centimeter. Um, so that it means we can treat um, from below common iliac level down to obstructive level for cervical cancer. Uh, but if we want to treat um, parotid nodal radiation, uh, we have to do two isocenter. Uh, right now, we are contouring based on MBS true protocol uh, that certify the patient into three risk groups, low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. So the suitable patient for MRNA should be low risk for sure, and some selected intermediate risk. But a high risk patient is not able to, to treat with only one um, isocenter of MRNA. Uh, here is an example of cervical cancer case. Uh, if you are also female with cervical cancer state three C one R with squamous muscle cell carcinoma, uh, we draw we withdraw the contour um, from common iliac level, um, bilateral external iliac, and inter iliac, and also obturator level, and also the pre circle, and we measure the P two length is approximately twenty centimeters. So um, this patient is able to be treated with MR line, and here's a the, the dose distribution. Uh, this patient received a concurrent cremal radiation, 55 gray, uh, 45 gray in 25 fraction to hold pelvis and boost the lymph node to 55 to 57.5 gray with SIB technique. And um, he's showing the, 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 the dose is very conform to the lymph node and, and also to P2E uh, 45. However, uh, after 10 fractions of treatment, we see that um, the tumor shrink. So the border of the P2V45 that we treat the tumor uh, is exceeded uh, into the posterior bladder. So we think that we should do the ATS so that we can adapt uh, the plan to be just only confined within the tumor area and not um, exit into the OARs. The next case is uh, the female, 59 years old, with cervical cancer state 2B with squamous cell carcinoma histology. Um, this patient uh, has a very quite um, small uh, tumor confined uh, uh, just within the cervix, but uh, involved uh, bilateral parameter, but not into pelvic side wall. So she was stated as 2B. Here is the contour. And here is the dose distribution and showing the PTV uh, 45 and the dose, 95% uh, is green color and 100% is red color. As you can see that we want to uh, uh, con 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 we want to confine the dose to the PTV and make it very conform. However, we don't want it to be too hot within the within the midline structure because uh, we are preserving for uh, brachytherapy. So we accepting 95% dose is, is okay, but we don't want it to be 100 or a higher or very hot into the, the, the midline that we're going to do the, the brachytherapy. Right now, we are following the dose constraint according to embrace through protocol. And on the left side, is a table showing the dose constraint from Ambestro, and the right side is the dose dosimetric criteria for this patient. As you can see, that it's not all green. That means uh, some criteria did not pass the constraint, and it's up to the physician that how much exceeding dose or volume that you're going to accept for the patient. And here is a, an example, the serial MR images that uh, we did for every fraction, but I just pick up only some of the fraction for this patient during the treatment. Uh, you can notice that the tumor tend to shrink and the signal tend to change. Um, it quite have a very good response, but since the patient has a small volume of tumor, so you cannot see a dramatic response for like the large volume of tumor. And at three months after treatment, this patient had a complete response from MRI. We can see that the signal showing the port treatment uh, hypo signal in T2 weathered image without any risk diffusion. So uh, we interpret that the patient has a complete response. And this is very interesting because uh, since MRNAC is able to perform MRI in every fraction of treatment, so we have a valuable images 
and a lot of images that we can't do many researches. For example, for MR radiomics, uh, actually we used to do uh, this research uh, on radiomics about MR image in cervical cancer. Uh, we uh, we study in 90 cervical cancer patients with pretreatment treatment T2 with an MRI, and we want to know that does any radiomic features that significant correlated with the radiotherapy outcome. So um, we uh, found that there were two parameters of two features that were significantly correlated with local regional recurrence. There was a maximum intensity and correlation 135 GLCM. Actually, there were several studies of MR radiomic in cervical cancer. Uh, some of the study want to predict the outcome, like our study, uh, and most of the study use MR images, either T2 with an image or deficient image, like DWI or ADC. And some of the study use these MR images to predict the treatment response after uh, concurrent chemo radiation or after uh, chemotherapy. Uh, however, uh, different study show the different uh, radiomic features that significantly correlated with the treatment response. There were very few study evaluated about the difference of radiomic features uh, between pretreatment MRI and PBK therapy MRI. Uh, because in every case, we have pretreatment MRI and pre therapy for cervical cancer. So we can use these images to evaluate the, the correlation with clinical outcome. Why does SHIP matters? Because there was study on prostate cancer with MR LINAC. Uh, the other adult, the contour on bladder and rectum, and a uh, study about the correlation between the features of these OAR and the toxicity that happened for the patient. And the outcome tend to show that the change of signal or the features of these MI images of bladder and rectum tend to associate it with the GU and GI toxicity. So we think that uh, the change or the shift of the features of MI images from pretreatment to pre therapy, we can uh, extract this data and do the research that uh, whether or not this chip of the features significantly uh, correlated with the clinical outcome, either local recurrence, nodal recurrence, determinatis, uh, and also overall survival. Because uh, we have daily MR images, right? So uh, since we, if we know that some features or some uh, chips significantly correlated with the tumor response or clinical outcome, it can help us uh, certify the patient who should be received uh, escalated therapy, like more dose or more H1 chemo, uh, instead of observe after concrete chemo radiation, or if the patient is so risk, so we are quite sure that we, we can observe. We, we don't need to give a, any escalated dose or more H1 chemotherapy. So it can help us uh, to personalize treatment for the patient. The next example is the recurrence cases. Uh, here is, is 47 years old female with history of cervical cancer state 3 c one r uh, T3B and 1M0, and she received concurrent chemo radiation 45 gray and boosted lymph node 255 gray with concurrent cisplatin for 5 cycle and brachytherapy for 4 cycle with a total dose to D90HRCTV of 90 gray EQD2. However, the MR post treatment shows suspicious residual tumor at like uterocecal ligament because at the beginning uh, we, we, we saw the tumor involved in this area and at, at the time of brachytherapy uh, we still noticed that oh it's still the, the tumor here but we were not able to implant in in, in this area with brachytherapy. So uh, we decided to boost with SBRT after finish uh, brachytherapy at one month. So here's a contour that we draw. Uh, it's quite very really close to rectum, but uh, we can do a very conformed dose to this uh, crystal tumor. And we 
prescribe uh, SBRT of six gray times five fraction. Here is the specific criteria. Uh, so it passed all the criteria, it's all green. And the MR port SBRT at two months uh, show a complete response of the tumor. So you can notice that here is still the, uh, the, 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 the right side of the rectum here, the, 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 the nodule hyposignal, but um, here the, the right side images, you no longer can notice the, the nodule or residual tumor. So it has a very quite uh, good response to radiotherapy. The next case is 82 years old, female with circle cancer, but we did not know the state at that time because she received chronic pain at at the hospital 20 years ago, but she presented with at our department with a uh, left leg edema. So we performed the CT whole abdomen and uh, the CT show metal lymph node at right pelvic region. So uh, it's quite large tumor as you can see on the MR images. And we prescribe also a six square time five fraction to this tumor. And we kind of like have a SIB within the tumor in the GTV. So the PTV is six gray, but the GTV is uh, maybe seven or eight gray, uh, time five fraction. So it's gonna be very hard in the GTV. Uh, because we want to uh, compromise the dose to the bowel, the nearby bowel and the nearby um, sigmoid. And here's the, the, the image of MR at third fraction and fifth fraction. Um, the tumor tend to be the same. We did not notice the shrinkage much. And seeing that this patient were treated, uh, like finished within a month ago, so we did not have the MR post yet. So for cervical cancer, we did treat it with MR and X. Total seven patients, five primary and two recurrence. Uh, these patients show a very good outcome, 100% local control and 100% of all survival with a very low acute LAG or angiotoxicity. We did not notice any grade two or more toxicity. But however, um, the, the, the outcome were based on only six cases because the, the seven cases we did not perform the, the MR images yet. To summarize, in my line neck, as well as hospital, we quite uh, have a very experienced quite a, a number of patients and almost 5,000 fractions. And for MR only workflow, we think that it is possible to do it in the clinic because showing no different in the contouring and the dose um, calculation. And the MR line neck is appealing, okay, both prostate cancer for sure, and also cervical cancer, although it has limitation because cervical cancer has quite uh, internal organ motion and it has a very good response to radiotherapy, therapy so that we can do the adaptive plan for cervical cancer. And MI and I can provide us a very valuable images that we can do many research on such as um, the radiomics that we can do by using these images. And uh, we can use any kind of images in the future, like functional images, like diffusion image also to, to do the research on radiomics. Thank you. Innovation and you, Philips. Thank you to both doctors from Siri Raj. Just a reminder to please feel free to type your questions in the boxes provided, and they will be addressed live by our speakers at the end of the session. Our next speaker is Dr. Nigel Anderson. Nigel is the Chief Radiation Therapist and Radiation Therapy Manager at the Olivia Newton-John Cancer and Wellness and Research Centre in Australia. His presentation is entitled, Implementing MR Image Guided Simulation and Treatment into a Radiation Oncology Clinic. Over to you, Nigel. Innovation and you, Phillips. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, to everyone watching this webinar this afternoon, um, wherever you may be in the world. Uh, my name is Nigel Anderson. I'm the Radiation Therapy Manager and Chief Radiation Therapist at the Austin Health Radiation Oncology Network from Melbourne, um, Victoria, Australia. And today I'm going to 
take you through a bit of our discussion around um, what our team's done by the implementation of our MR guided simulation and treatment program within our radiation oncology clinic. So first of all, a little bit of background. Back in the May of 2018, which was very different times where we currently live in now, um, there was an announcement for some funding for an MR Linac um, to, to be um, placed at our, our service, which is the Living Newton John Cancer Wellness and Research Centre um, in Melbourne. Um, and this was going to be the third of the of these of MR, MR Linacs um, in Australia at the time, with one previously installed up in in Townsville, up in Queensland, in the far north of Queensland, also one in Sydney um, as well. And ours was going to be the third of those um, become available for Victorian cancer patients, which is the state in which we live in. Um, as I said, it would be the first in Victoria. Um, and, and I guess as an aside to that, as an addition to that, which um, was, will be the first in Australia, is that we're also um, having supported a uh, 1.5 Tesla MRI simulator, which was funded from within our own department funds um, to support our ML8 program. So we really had a comprehensive um, service um, affiliated with our, an MR service um, for our department and our, and our service. Um, and since then, we've had some subsequent um, MR Linac installments as, installs as well, one in Perth and also one across the ditch in New Zealand as well. So first, a little bit about our population. Victoria is geographically, as you can see there, it's actually quite a small state um, in the, the huge land mass that is Australia with a uh, just over 220,000 square kilometre um, uh, land mass um, with a population of just over six and a half million people. Um, but in terms of population density, it is the actual most densely populated state within Australia. Uh, and we have four of the um, of the top 20 largest cities within Australia located within our, our state of Victoria. So obviously Melbourne being the largest, we also have a number of regional cities as well, which would be um, supported by this MLNX service. Um, comparing that to Thailand, um, where our um, other speaker is, is from today, um, obviously Thailand in terms of land mass is, is about twice the size of Victoria, but obviously the population density um, within that, that region, that part of the world, in particular in Bangkok, um, where the MRL is in Thailand, um, it's servicing a very different um, population of patients in terms of access, accessibility for the, for the MR program. Um, if you look at purely at the number of people per square kilometre, it's very different between um, how we operate in the state of Victoria and how um, our Thai counterparts and colleagues um, work. So in terms of the state-based Victorian service, so obviously Victoria is a state um, within um, Australia and is in our service, and our MR program is the only one available um, in our state. And so really what we wanted to focus on from the outset is really ensuring that clinical indications where the maximum benefit could be gained from an MR guidance, we're actually included in our program. Um, and that patients will be referred for radiation therapy by a radiation oncologist or member of a MDM from another major service who had really understood the intricacies of um, MR guided radiation therapy um, and to ensure that what we were getting was the, the patients that would benefit most from what is, will be still a limited service um, available to Victorian cancer patients. So the, the idea of the service would be that patients would come to us um, to be um, part of our MR program, but then would also, um, upon completion of their treatment, be returned to the originating service um, for continued follow-up. So that we would very much be a statewide service where patients would be referred in, have their treatment, and then um, have their continued follow-up um, beyond that um, from their referral um, centre. And also the aim was to minimise patient-led referrals, so to ensure that they were really coming from, as I said previously, a service where um, there was a really key understanding of the benefits of what an MR program can offer for the patients, um, such that you know, we can actually get appropriate triaging um, of our service. I'm not going to go into the detail because I'm sure you're all aware of the benefits of an MR guided radiotherapy and in particular the difference between what an MR can offer compared to what the current standard of um, comb MCTs and the resolution that we see in that. Um, so I don't need to preach to the converted. You're aware of, of the benefits of what an MR can we can see visually. Uh, and what that really enables us to do is to, you know, obviously be able to see what we plan to treat a lot better, in particular on the on the day-to-day -day treatment fractions, and really treat with far greater confidence in terms of delineating and understanding what our target volumes are, but also those um, ever important or was at risk that surround um, the targets as well. So again, we all know that, um, but this is what, you know, we've finally come to fruition and had this tool at our disposal being an MR Linac and an MR program um, that enables us to do this. 
And what that really enables us to do is to treat cases that have been really difficult to treat previously and done with far more uncertainty than what an MR LINAC um, and MR um, simulation slash MR LINAC program enables us to do. Um, enables us to really highlight where we need to treat and avoid those areas we don't want to treat, as you can see from a couple of examples here um, in the pelvis. But what this really took first, take a step back before we, we got to this, this point where we were able to utilise these, this MR service and develop this program, there had to be a, you know, a lot of work to undergo in our department, I had to take out an old NAC, um, which as most of you will be aware is, is a really um, um, labour intensive process and also then bring in an ML NAC and simulator into our, into our program, which included a lot of um, refurbishment of our already existing bunker to, to accommodate the, the ML NAC and also um, the simulator as well. So we finally, after a, you know navigating our way through COVID, like everyone has over the last few years, we were able to get ourselves to a point where um, we had our MR simulator operational in, in April in 2021, so getting close to sort of 18 months ago. And then about three to four months after that, we had our, our treated our first patient on our MR LINAC uh, in August 2021, which is a really exciting time after a lot of hard work from a number of different um, key stakeholders across the project. Um, we finally got our program up and running, which was, which was fantastic. So what we ended up with at the end was a uh, Philips 1.5T Ingenia um, and to complement the Elector Unity. So as I said at the start, we were um, the first centre in Australia to have both not only the Elector Unity um, platform to deliver our treatment, but also the accompanying MR simulator and that being the Philips um, Ingenia, which was you know really exciting and provided a real, really solid platform for us to develop a, a really um, one-stop shop MR um, radiotherapy program. So some of the benefits or some of the, I guess, the key features, sorry, of each of this technology, the Philips Ingenia has a 70 centimetre ball, which is obviously very conducive um, to, uh, I guess, radiation therapy setups. Um, and also with an extended 55 centimetre field of view, we had some MR SIM couch top um, with indexing, which again is um, really conducive to our radiotherapy environment, ensuring that we can have a reproducible um, patient from transitioning from simulation to treatment. We've got the left laser bridge, we've got vital line navigator and bellows to monitor breathing traces. Um, and then switching across to the Unity, we've got the 7 MV flattening field of free 1.5 T MRI um, of the Unity. So these two pieces of equipment really complement each other um, quite well. And in particular, the, the 1.5 Tesla, um, for us in radiation oncology, it's really important to be able to translate what we see at simulation to what we um, um, treat um, on the on the LIDAC. And, and having um, an equivalent um, capacity of the scanner is really important to enable this. So we weren't actually scanning things on our, on our simulator and not being able to visualise them on the treatment because that would really make um, life difficult for our treating teams and um, I guess ensuring that that confidence is there to be able to deliver um, what we think we're delivering. Um, there's also the added benefits of the engineer as well in terms of diffusion weighted imaging as well, which um, we're looking to continue to develop um, our program upon. So, so really the, the key message is why do we choose this combination? It really is that consistency um, between and an equivalence between the two pieces of technology that enable us to really streamline our um, MR program. There's a number of clinical considerations we needed to, to take into account um, in implementing this program. Um, and the first one being um, referrals and, and, and consultations. So what we did as part of this pro program is recognising that it was a, a statewide service and it wasn't just patients that would traditionally be coming from our, our catchments that um, we will be relying upon to to utilise our service. So we we gained um, the input from all of our public radiotherapy providers in the state of Victoria here. And what we did was we developed a series of clinical indications, which if you scan on this QR code now, we'll take you through to those. Um, I won't go through them in the detail today due to the um, lack of time, but what we did is we, in consultation with a number of our um, radiation oncology colleagues across the state, developed a whole series of clinical indications which would guide um, which patients we would um, be referred to us um, and really give a, um, I guess, a starting point as to where um, our, I guess, clinical rollout will begin and continue to go um, over time. Next, um, obviously, obviously, is the MR simulation environment um, and something that we haven't really had to deal with in particular um, in a radiation oncology department before because usually we've relied on the support of our radiology um, friends to provide this the imaging um, or MR imaging when required for, for certain indications. Um, so some of the things we had to learn and really develop, and we were fortunate within our team, we've also employed an um, MRI radiographer as well to really help develop this program, which has been a really pertinent step in ensuring that we're getting the image quality 
um, requirements um, or the, the, I guess, appropriate image quality to, to maximise the benefit of the technology um, and really understand the you know, requirements and the priority for radiation ecology. They're different to radiology, so really trying to, I guess, separate ourselves from what traditionally has been a, a domain of radiologists and also to ensure we get the, you know, the best quality image for our treatment, again, so that we can translate that to our, our unity and treatment machine. So we've, um, to help with this, we've implemented the ethics approved um, volunteer study, um, which is looking at healthy volunteers and patient volunteers and using their image data sets um, to optimize the images to ensure we get the very best um, quality image that will help us to be able to deliver the very best treatment um, once we these patients move from simulation to unity. And we had a number of our staff members volunteer uh, as part of this program um, to really fast track um, and better understand the technology, this new technology we have at our disposal. And ultimately what that meant was, as I touched on um, a number of slides ago, was ensuring that the images that we were capturing at our MR simulation stage were actually capable of being um, visualised or really reproduced uh, much like our radiation therapy setup. The images were most were able to be reproduced on our UD platform so that we could be confident that what we're seeing um, or what we're treating we're able to see and visualise on a day-to-day -day basis to really facilitate those adaptive platforms which the Unity is so well um, renowned for and what is the real, I guess, the, the benefit of having a, a unity that is part of our treatment workflow. Safety is another, th another thing which we really needed to, um, I guess, really beef up, I guess, as we, as we prepared for an MR um, program. Um, and things that we haven't really had to, I guess, consider in, in a normal radiation oncology environment, it's usually radiation is our, um, I guess, our major concern, how do we mitigate risk in that space? But in terms of um, MRI safety, it's something we really haven't had to deal with. So we really had to um, really address this very early on. Um, and not just the, I guess, the, the direct MR LIDAC team of physicists, radiation oncologists and radiation therapists who are working in this space, but also our, our wider um, our wider team to ensure that they were aware of some of the considerations that needed to, need to take place in order to have a, a safe program for everyone who walks through our doors. Um, so what we did is we, we trained staff um, and also developed a radiation oncology MR safety manual, which is available for, for everyone. Um, and in particular, we developed a um, an MRI safety um, online training module, which everyone who uh, works in that department has to complete to give them a very basic understanding of, um, I guess, some of the safety considerations for MR. Uh, and that was a really important um, step in, um, I guess, as we as we became clinical with our with this technology. Um, and some of that uh, included. Um, understanding the layout of our department, which areas in particular were, I guess, at highest risk of MR safety um, concerns. Um, and, and every member of our team, whether you're working in reception, whether you're working as a nurse in our trolley bay, or whether you're as a radiation therapist working on the, the LINAC or the MR LINAC, um, knowing where the, I guess, the touch points were and where the places to go, or where the places that were at highest risk and where those were at lowest risk are, um, were particularly important. Obviously, with the new technology um, and still being very, um, I guess, immature in the Australian landscape and even in the Oceania landscape as well and, and even into Asia, um, we do need a strong collaborations in this space to ensure we're optimising the technology and making sure we're getting the very best out of it, but also making sure that we're all the process we're following aligned with, with our colleagues abroad, um, locally and abroad, to ensure we, we, we're being safe in what we do. So we've, we've formed some strong links with the Electa Unity Consortium, um, which has been fantastic. Um, also the Trans-Tasman Radiation Oncology uh, Network, and there's also an MR and RT interest group that um, our um, director, Fashion Fruity, is, is the chair of, um, which is great. So we've, we've got collective minds that we can actually um, draw on experiences from. Um, also within the Victorian Department of Health, a specialised radiation oncology technologies committee. So obviously the Victorian Department of Health is really critical in, in funding this technology um, for us and our team. Um, and also within um, our own local um, environment, that being the Austin Health Imaging Departments in molecular imaging and our radiology departments, who also obviously have a lot of experience in the, in the um, diagnostic imaging and MR in particular space, um, we're able to touch on and use some of their expertise to help guide us through this initial stages. And I think, as I said previously, this was helped by um, a member of our team being the um, uh, MR radiographer, which helped us, I guess, navigate some of these early challenges and um, discussions and with an experience, level of experience that we haven't before seen within our department. So that's been really um, a valid uh, member of our team over the time. 
Um, equally importantly, we've had a number of, um, we've got a really strong relationship with both Electra and Philips um, based on um, the two pieces of technology we have. And we, we have um, reference side agreement with Philips Healthcare and we're just in the final stages of finalising one with Electra as well, which is a really important step in ensuring that we um, really optimise the use of our technologies and ensure that we get the very best out of it. So ultimately we can give the very best care um, to our patients. Um, as I touched on earlier, it's a very new technology, not just Australia, but also globally. So the level of evidence is still very, um, I guess, limited um, in this space, um, which is why you know we've made a really concerted effort within our department in particular um, to really contribute to research and development to ensure that we're getting um, the very best, um, I guess, data um, from our patients that come through and to ensure that we're really using that to improve what we do and develop what we do and really contribute to not only ensuring that we give the very best care we can within our team, but also contribute to the wider community in terms of literature and publications as well. Um, so as a consequence of that, we have um, every patient um, recruited via a study um, by a study protocol and we're recording and keeping a whole series of metrics on these patients to be able to, in terms of follow up technical considerations um, as well, which is a really important aspect of rolling out a new program. Um, we've also been successful so far in, in gathering funding across a number of different platforms to support research um, in this space, because as I said, it's very new and something we need to, um, we feel obliged and um, to contribute to. And we've also put in a number of other applications in this space. And also uh, in this um, in this domain, we've also got a number of higher degree students across many disciplines um, who are doing projects on novel concepts in the radiation oncology MLNAC space, um, which will no doubt not only contribute to the growth of our service and, and what we're able to offer, but also in terms of the, the wider literature and, and how we can support um, the development and use of this technology, um, as I said, which is very um, much in its early days, um, both locally and also globally. So a little bit of an update on where we're sitting today. Um, as you can see here, we, we commenced, um, and a large majority of our work has been sort of above the shoulders. We've done a lot of work in the, uh, the brain space and also in the head and neck space. Uh, but more recently, we've moved into um, other sites as well. You can see we've, we've um, moved into breasts in terms of ABBI treatments. I mean, both the supine and prone positions. We've also moved into a, um, um, a breast prone single fraction pre-surgery um, protocol as well, which we've recently recruited our first patient to. We've also moved into um, prostate um, and oligometastatic work as well, which we're seeing some real benefit and starting to utilise the adapter shape functionality even more um, due to the I guess the, I guess the movement we see in these parts of the body and, and what this adaptive shape functionality can, can help us with. So in terms of what that looks in terms of numbers, to date we've treated um, in excess of 850 treatment fractions and that's really powering towards um, 1,000 as we speak and may actually even be at that point by the time this presentation um, is seen. Um, you know, we've done over 250 MR simulations um, and as we, this is only ramping up our level of activity is increasing and increasing further as we open up more clinical sites, um, which obviously opens up this technology to more and more um, patients um, to be referred to us. Um, imminent clinical sites, upper GI, and it may even be at the point where, where again, as this presentation is showing that we've actually treated our first upper GI, we're again looking at um, you know, the stereotactic fractionated treatments as well, and also looking to move to a um, shortened fractionation for our prostate um, patients also. So it's a really exciting time currently within our within our team as we're looking to really progress a number of treatment sites and, and offering this technology um, in both the simulation space and you know, translating that into our treatment space as well. So it's a really um, exciting period for us. So in conclusion, um, this was a statewide project funded, um, which opened, started funded by our, our state government, recognised the importance of this niche technologies um, in both simulation and treatment space for Victorian cancer patients, which we, you know, again, after navigating COVID opened um, in 2021. Um, it has required significant staff upskill um, to ensure optimal patient safety. As I touched on earlier, this is an area which we, in particular MR, we haven't dabbled in um, prior to this. So there was a significant, um, I guess, learning curve for our teams. Um, we really had to follow a really measured, structured rollout of clinical sites as well. We didn't just go in and start referring patients and um, without doing a lot of the development and background work, which is required to implement this safely. So we've been really measured in how we've rolled out our clinical sites um, over the last 12 months to ensure it's really safe and that when we're ready to go, we're ready to go and, and patients are um, seeing the very best of the technology. 
Um, what we've seen, obviously, being new technology, is a great opportunity to lead the state in radiation oncology care and research with a technology that no one else has got within our state. So we've really um, jumped on that. And, and as I said earlier, we've, we've been ensuring that patients are enrolled in clinical protocols and clinical trials to ensure that we're collecting data, which will contribute to the greater good uh, moving forward as, as more and more MRL, um, oh, MR-guided radiation oncology programs come to fruition. Um, of course, this wouldn't have occurred without the strong collaborative partnerships we've got um, with, in particular, Electa and Philips um, through their through the equipment we have on site and then the, being able to touch base with them and ensure we're getting the very best out of the technology that we have at our disposal, um, which is obviously really important to maximise the benefit um, for our patients. So in finishing, I'd like to thank in particular our team here at the at Austin Health in Melbourne. I won't go into every single person because I'd be here all day, but from right through from our multidisciplinary team of physics, radiation oncologists, um, radiation therapists, our nursing, um, they've all contributed to this program and all play a really critical role in ensuring that we you know, continue to deliver the best care um, for our team, uh, for, our, for our patients, um, our state government obviously for the funding to support uh, the purchase of um, these technologies and obviously to Electra and Phillips um, Healthcare as well for their their support of our program and ensuring that we again we can give the very best care um, and develop and optimize the technology we have at our disposal uh, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about our center please scan on um, the qr code here it will take you through and you can learn a little bit more about what we do and our service so thank you thank you very much nigel um, we have some questions coming through now, but please continue to add them as we commence our live Q&A session. Just a reminder, at the end of this, we'll, um, we'll provide you a link for a, a feedback survey. We really do appreciate your feedback, and I promise you it will be read, and, and, and we do uh, try and take suggestions on future things you'd like to see. But for now, uh, Alison, do we have some questions? We do. So the first question is for Dr. Dunkelche. Um, have you seen the use of MRI accelerate in recent years, and do you see it becoming essential for certain clinical indications? Um, for uh, my opinion, uh, the, the, the first thing is for the MR simulation workflow fit out CT simulations. It's helped to reduce time for patients and help uh, radiation oncologists uh, for contouring that lead to uh, precise of the dose distribution. And the second one, uh, the MR is useful for the prediction of the prognosis uh, in the cancer treatment, uh, same as uh, Dr. Vivesh I mentioned. And the third one, uh, the MR uh, is uh, useful for the clearly position in the treatment room same like the, in the MR Renek that Dr. Vivach has shown. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Anderson, uh, you've seen a rapid uptake of Unity recently. Has MR allowed you more confidence in implementation due to clearer visualization? the ability to have, as I touched on in our presentation, to be able to have a simulator and a LINAC that produces the same quality of image certainly gives us greater confidence to be able to deliver, um, I guess, treat what we, we suspect. Um, and I think by having, you know, as I said, having an Ingenia as well as the, the MRL, I think that that was one of the key, As I, again, as I touched on in the presentation, that was one of our key, um, I guess, wants in, in our program that we could actually, what we could see at simulation, we could be confident in delivering treatment on the on the Unity. So I think having, you know, as we open up more sites, we become more and more confident with our utilisation, being able to, to achieve just that. So, yeah, I think that's been a real big win for our, for our team, having both pieces of technology at our disposal. Maybe just to follow up on that, Dr. Anderson, um, what experience do you have? I mean, how important is it to compare a 1.5 to 1.5 or what's your experience there in terms of Tesla strength? Yeah, I think that's, again, as I touched on before, I think it's really important um, in radiation oncology and radiation therapy treatment, it's particularly important to be comparing like with like. So um, by... Being the equivalent point being able to 
have a fantastic image at, at simulation and then actually go into your treatment and not being able to um, have the equivalent um, on, on your treatment um, um, platform. Because if you can't see what you've seen at simulation, there's no point. Uh, it makes the treatment particularly difficult and challenging. So I think having both of those um, equivalent um, is, is really important. And we've noticed that difference. Um, and you know, obviously to get the maximum benefit out of the MRI visualization, which obviously we don't have in our conventional Linux um, with our Comb BMCT platform. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, there's a question here which I might direct to Dr. Wiwachai, um, and it's about um, patient compliance in terms of um, undergoing imaging either on the on the Philips MR or the Electa Unity in terms of patients' compliance in terms of claustrophobia and things like that. I know that these are questions possibly that have been answered many years ago in the diagnostic realm, but in radiation oncology clinics, I guess people are interested in how patients, how compliant patients are uh, in, in being either imaged or treated on one of these devices? Well, thanks for the question. Um, at the US hospital, we did not notice um, many patients um, experience with claustrophobia, but um, there was uh, a few number of patients who had a claustrophobia. But if you think that that patient really needed for MR simulation. So sometimes we consulted for the anesthetist to do the, the you know, sedation for to do the MR simulation. Um, but for MR LINAC, uh, we did not um, suggest the patient with claustrophobia because there would be um, quite amount number of uh, sedation and the patient have to, to, to go in the, the machine quite deep, um, um, increased risk for a sedation. So um, we just um, did it with the MR simulation. But for MR line act, um, I think um, we must um, counseling have a very good counseling with patient to 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 to, to use this machine who having a claustrophobia. See one other question, which is also directed to Dr. Siti Wong, but I think it can also apply to everyone. Um, but I'll start start with you again, Dr. Siti Wong. Um, do you see any benefits for MRCAT outside of the areas that you're currently use the, using them, or do you have experience with MRCAT beyond just the pelvis? Okay, thanks for the question. Um, in my opinion, I think um, Hanek and Brain would be benefit from MRCAT also because this region, the contouring was dominantly based on the MRI. So if we can just use one image um, platform so we can eliminate the problem with the fusion. And moreover, um, the patient with Hanek cancer, most of them um, have trouble with um, respiration or pain, so they it's, it's better to do just one step a platform so they do not have to um, do many uh, times on the simulation couch. And at CS Hospital, we did um, the MRCAT on pelvis, prostate and endometrial cancer, and we are developing and um, we now conducting to do it on the, the, the brain also. So let's see the outcome. Great. Thank you. And uh, another question here, which I might direct to, uh, to you, Nigel, um, is regarding internal credentialing. Uh, I think to, to summarise this question, not everyone in the department can have direct uh, applications training from either Philips or Electa. Have you guys thought about how you're going to do your internal credentialing to move staff around, um, you know, operating these devices? Yeah, for sure. I mean, definitely we've started our, our team as a dedicated MR team, and that's in both the simulation space as well as the treatment space um, because of the, I guess, the steep learning curve that is required and the additional learnings that are required as being part of this, uh, these both of these technologies. So we have a, a dedicated team which is credentialed um, in our simulator space, and we're also fortunate that we actually have a, an MR radiographer as part of our team. So he's played a really critical role in ensuring that our that our team is supported in that space. But as part of that, we've brought a number of RTs along um, within that team to get to a certain level so that they're able to, but also so that we can, you know, not rely solely on a radiographer within our team. Um, in terms of the treatment side of things, again, we having the dedicated team has enabled 
workforce to specialise certain team members in certain indications um, and also bring new members gradually into the team as well. So we wouldn't do a mass changeover or rotations of staff like we would do in our traditional um, RT teams, but we were able to bring in um, various members of the team at certain intervals and upskill them um, in all aspects, right from safety right through to treatment planning and, and treatment as well, um, such that we're um, again focusing on safety and ensuring that everything's done you know, in an incredibly meticulous way, um, such that um, our program and our patients aren't compromised at all. Because as you said, it, it's it's a very different technology and it's a very different way of doing things compared to our traditional process, so we're very mindful of that. Um, and there's a number of boxes that need to be ticked um, along the way before staff can become sort of independent um, in that space. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for your experience. Um, thank you so much to our speakers, Dr. John Kulchai, Dr. Siti Wong, and Dr. Anderson for taking time to present and answer a few questions. So with that, I want to thank the audience as well. And let's conclude today's session. Um, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Just a reminder about that feedback survey, which you can see on the screen now. If you could just take 20 seconds to give us some feedback on how this session went and, again, ideas you'd like to see in the future. Um, and this presentation, for those who couldn't make it live, should be available in the, in the coming weeks. So you can direct your colleagues towards that uh, quite soon. Thank you so much.